My name is Dennis Cooley. I am the director of the Northern Plains Ethics Institute at NDSU. Um, and I welcome you to our February speaker. Professor Talbert is part of the Learning the Language of Diversity and Meaningful Inclusion project that uh, we are running in conjunction with the YWCA KS uh, Clay. And we have a number of sponsors who I'll mention near there to the end. But I want to get to the talk. I will first, though, introduce my colleague and associate director of the Northern Plains Ethics Institute. Her name is Leanne Wolf of Great Outcomes Consulting. She will be taking over moderator and just uh, when we get to the questions section. Speaking of questions, uh, if you want to put those in chat, that would be the most helpful so that Leanne can see them and then convey them to Professor Tallbear. Next, though, I want to turn it over to President Brashani of North Dakota State University to introduce our distinguished speaker, President Brashani. Thank you, Dr. Cooley, and, and thank you all. I, I see we've got a terrific turnout today for the, the latest in our speaker series that started with Supreme Court uh, Justice Page and has uh, gone as diverse uh, up to a distinguished scholar that we have meeting with us today, Dr. Kim Talbear, who's an associate professor in Native Studies at the University of Alberta and a Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Peoples, Technoscience and the Environment. She's the author of Native American DNA, Tribal Belongings, and the False Promise of Genetic Science. She's also the co-founder of the Summer Internship for Indigenous Peoples in Genomics, otherwise known as SING Canada, and faculty member in SING USA. Dr. Talbert is a regular commentator in US, Canadian, and UK media outlets on issues ranging from Indigenous Peoples, science, technology, and the environment. She's a regular panelist on Canada-based weekly broadcast Media Indigena, and she is a citizen of the Sistan Wapanen Oyate, is also a descendant of Cheyenne and Arapaho tribes of Oklahoma. Without further ado, let me turn it over to our distinguished scholar and speaker today, Dr. Talbert. Thank you. It's really great to be here. Um, usually there's more announcements, so I'm not used to just being able to jump right in. This is great. So before I um, get started on the talk, I just wanted to um, acknowledge where I am. So I am a, a citizen of the Sistan Wapden Oyate, which is I think about 80 miles south of Fargo. I haven't I used to shop in Fargo, so <laughs> when I lived at home, um, so I've done that drive a lot. Uh, but right now, I'm at the University of Alberta, um, about and we're Edmonton is about a thousand miles directly north of Salt Lake City. So to give you some orientation, if you haven't been up here, and uh, we are located on Treaty Six territory. So the treaties in Canada were uh, signed according to numbers, like one through I don't remember how many there were. I'm still learning my Canadian current uh, events and history. Uh, knowledge. But so Treaty 6 territory is uh, this kind of um, lower middle section of Alberta, and it's a traditional gathering place for Indigenous people that include, include especially Cree, uh, Blackfoot, we say Blackfeet in the US, they say Blackfoot up here, those people cross between Montana and Alberta and their traditional homelands. Métis people, uh, Nakota Sioux, we say Nakota in the Dakotas, they say Nakota up here, so I have uh, cultural relatives up here, uh, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, and Anishinaabe people, as well as Inuit. Uh, so there's a very kind of um, vibrant uh, in multicultural indigenous community here. So I really, really love Edmonton. If I can't be at home, uh, this is the next plus best place to be. So I'm going to talk today um, about indigenization, reconciliation, and decolonization in science. And I realize that's a lot of buzzwords. And so we're going to define them because I feel like often we're not on the same page all the time uh, in terms of the way that we use these, these words. And so in order to get to the case study part of my talk that I think is the really interesting part and in the examples of how this stuff plays out in practice, I want to start with some definitions. So um, Let's see, let's, uh, oh, we don't need to move to the next slide quite yet. Um, so it's these terms, indigenization, we're gonna talk about inclusion, reconciliation and decolonization. And I'm particularly drawing on a 2018 article. Um, my notes just went away here. 
I'm particularly drawing on a 2018 article uh, in the journal Alternative, which is spelled alternative, but it's, it looks like alternative. It's got both parts capitalized. And this 2018 article is, was by uh, Adam Godry and Daniel Lorenz, uh, both from the University of Alberta. And they're laying out uh, the differences in these terms. So the first person they cite is Rauna Kokkonen. And Rauna Kokkonen is a Sami scholar. I think she's originally from Finland and she just moved back there in the last couple of years from the University of Toronto, there is because we're in the kind of top of the world, there is kind of a lot of back and forth between indigenous people in uh, lands now called Canada, and among Sami people across Scandinavia. So that's been really interesting to be up here. Um, some of the same kind of wildlife species that are that are integral to indigenous cultures in the uh, top of the world, um, move, but you know, move between those, <clears throat> those areas. So they cite Rauna Kokkonen on indigenization. And she simply says that it represents a move to expand the academy's still narrow conceptions of knowledge to include indigenous perspectives in transformative ways. The word transformative is key. So it's not about just listening and thinking about indigenous perspectives, but how are you going to actually use those to transform the academy? That's the hard part. Um, and so then they, they begin with kind of the first level of indigenization in this article. So again, for those of you in the academy who are really interested in this, even though they're talking about the Canadian Acad Academy, you'll recognize a lot of similarities with the US. So this could be a really helpful article to, to sit with and, and learn from uh, and use it to guide some of your language a little bit. So inclusion, they're saying, and we all know this, equity, diversity, and inclusion, right? This is common sense to a lot of us in the academy now, uh, aims to increase the number of Indigenous students uh, and supports adaptation of Indigenous students to the academy. So it really... Well, it does support Indigenous students in multiple ways. It might open up spaces for them. You might develop transition year programs if people are coming out of uh, school systems where they may not have been adequate adequately prepared for university, including certain majors like STEM fields. Uh, we need very good math uh, prep, especially to get into those majors. So there can be some supports for Indigenous students, but really a lot of it is about supporting them to do the adaptation, them to do the changing. Um, so indigenization, Gaudry and Lorenz say, is conceived of uh, primarily as a matter of inclusion and access. And the thought is, is that by merely including more Indigenous peoples, it's believed that universities can indigenize without substantial structural change. Next slide. So I'll give you some examples later on in the talk too about uh, our summer internship for Indigenous peoples and genomics does do inclusion. Uh, but you'll see, I think, after we get through these definitions that it actually works at all three levels, not just the inclusion level. So sometimes uh, so-called indigenization might go farther to attempt something called reconciliation. And that's a term that we use a lot up in Canada. I don't know how much you use it in North Dakota. I know we had a year of reconciliation in South Dakota back in the early 2000s, maybe. And I remember a really well-known Dakota scholar and writer, Elizabeth Cook Lynn, who's in my tribal writers group, which uh, is called the Oak Lake Writers. It's a Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota writer, writers. And we meet every summer in South Dakota. Um, Elizabeth Cooklin said in the year of South Dakota's reconciliation, I don't care about reconciliation. What I want is restitution of land. That's the decolonization level, which we'll get to. So that was kind of her snarky comment on that. But in general, I don't think re reconciliation is a word that's used as much down there. But let's go into what it means anyway, because I think the ideas are still operative uh, in, in the US Academy where, or at least the places where they're actually thinking about indigenous relations, which is you know not everywhere. So um, I, I'm giving you the dictionary definition of reconciliation first, because I think this might be what a lot of people think about, and I called it a settler colonial definition. It's not the very agential active definition uh, that we're seeing in indigenous led uh, reconciliation movements in Canada. It's the restoration of friendly relations, if you just look in the dictionary. Well, if you never had friendly relations, what are you restoring? Let's be careful with our language. Or the action of making one view or belief compatible with another. Well, what if indigenous worldviews are simply incompatible with a settler nation state worldview? And we can, we'll get into some of that in, in some of the science detail. What do you do? 
So basically this definition of reconciliation is assuming that you can make these worldviews reconcilable. And it's assuming that, that there were friendly relations to begin with and that friendly relations are possible. I think again, without substan substantial structural change. So the next slide is looking at what Godry and Lorenz call reconciliation indigenization. And that's even a, it's a greater level of reconciliation than your common dictionary term. I show the di di dictionary definition because I actually think a lot of non Indigenous Canadians are thinking about that definition of reconciliation. That's not what Indigenous people are thinking about at all, or those non-Indigenous people who take a really kind of active, knowing approach to reconciliation politics. So I have a little visual here on from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, and that has been led by... Um, Justice Murray Sinclair, he's an Anishinaabe, he's in Winnipeg, he's all he's in the uh, Canadian Senate, which is uh, not like our Senate, it's appointed for life until you retire. It's a kind of an honorific. I, I haven't quite figured out exactly what their relation is to Parliament. I'll, I'm still learning all this stuff. But he's a very well known Indigenous and Anishinaabe thinker, uh, legal thinker, and uh, head up the truth headed up the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And what they did is I think it was 2016 when they uh, issued their calls to action. So reconciliation was really about hearing the testimony of uh, residential school survivors. We call them boarding schools in the US. And uh, so a lot of uh, elders, although residentials, the final residential school in Canada didn't close until 1996, I think. So this is not only an ancient or kind of last century phenomenon, but they came before the commission and sort of gave testimony about the kinds of uh, abuse and decultural De deculturation, is that the word, that they encountered, uh, the, the banning of languages, uh, emotional, sexual, physical abuse, a lot of testimony happened. And what the TRC did was release their calls to action for the entire Canadian society, although I will say they didn't release any calls to action for science which I think is uh, an important thing to do. But they said, you know, what can media do? What can higher ed do? What can healthcare do to repair some of this history? And so if you're interested, you can Google that report online. So to go back to Godry and Lorenz, they talk about reconciliation as um, what sets reconciliation and indigenization apart from mere inclusion is an attempt to alter the university structure, including educating Canadian faculty, staff, and students to change how they think about and act toward indigenous people. So so this isn't, remember the last slide, simply about uh, making space for Indigenous students and then asking them to change or Indigenous staff and faculty. It's actually asking the broader society to learn something about this history and for them to make changes in how they think about Indigenous people. One of the things that has been really interesting and in watching the TRC play out in Canada is all of the non-Indigenous people who said, oh my God, I never knew, which is fascinating because you had a lot of regular Canadians staffing these residential schools. So the people who say they never knew about the kinds of abuse that went on in residential schools and the kind of uh, killing of culture, they may have had family members working in those schools. So it's really interesting about what was not spoken about. Um, so it's really been kind of um, a wake up call. So reconciliation, thinking about, so it's, it's, changing the way that the mainstream society thinks and acts. So I'm going to go to um, a kind of example of reconciliation in uh, science. Uh, so this quote is from Dr. Rod McInnes. And Rod McInnes is, I think he's still at McGill University in Montreal. He was the president of the American Society for Human Genetics, which is a global society despite its, its name, although totally dominated by North America. Uh, he was president of that association back in 2010-11. And at his presidential uh, lecture, so the outgoing president at the annual convention uh, gives a big speech. And uh, this was in the, uh, I was there, it was in Washington DC at the convention center. There was like 7,000 genome scientists and students, et cetera, in this big convention center in DC. And it was like the mega church of science. There were these uh, camera people up on scaffolds above the audience, these huge PowerPoint screens, really like a mega church, right? These big, uh, um, it was like a stage. They had these drop cloths and all these fancy lights, kind of like a Las Vegas showroom. And Rod McInnes is up there saying what at, was at the time really quite controversial. And I, it, it's not controversial now, but when I went back and read his speech uh, for this talk, I said, oh, in 2011, he was actually talking about what we have come to understand as reconciliation in a Canadian model. And here he is saying, you can read along, 
With respect to genetic research with Indigenous populations, I suggest that we must now be invited into the metaphorical tent of the Indigenous communities. The multicultural and international nature of the ASHG creates a major opportunity for it to make this happen to the benefit of all peoples. And so when he was talking about coming into the tent of Indigenous communities, he uh, mentions a couple of things in that speech. And you can, it was published in the ASHG journal. Um, I've got the citation here on the slide, if you can see it in 2011. It's, it's quite short. It's a few pages long, but worth reading. Uh, because at that time, what he was proposing in terms of collaborative research with Indigenous communities was being pushed back on, especially by the genome scientists that I was um, encountering when I was researching my book, Native American DNA. Back at that time, Canada had already been kind of ha having these conversations at a federal level and had proposed guidelines for research with Aboriginal people. That was the term they used back then uh, through the Canadian Institutes for Health Research. So federal guidelines and policy in 2011, 12 in Canada were still considered kind of radical in the United States genome science community at that time, but a lot of Indigenous people who were working with genome scientists were really kind of pushing these guidelines. And so just a, a couple of um, the ideas that he was putting forward in that speech and that was prevalent in Canada at the time were coming into common uh, currency. He said that we genome scientists need to recognize power differences and that researchers' cultural power has caused cultural harm. So, and that's something I focus on a lot. What is the cultural power of the genome sciences? Whose truth matters more, indigenous knowledge and their truths or the truths and knowledge of genome scientists? Uh, he said, we must increase awareness as scientists of the perspectives and concerns of indigenous people. So that's us needing to learn about them. That's part of reconciliation. We have to incorporate indigenous interests in research, not only scientists' interests. So if you're going to do research on indigenous blood, bones, hair, land resources, it might be kind of important to figure out uh, what those peoples who you're drawing the raw materials for research, what they actually think about, what questions do they want to ask? What are they interested in? What are some of their guidelines and ethics around managing data, samples, biologicals, et cetera? So in that plenary as well, even though I read it solidly as a reconciliation move, although he didn't use that language, because remember the Truth and Reconciliation Report wasn't released until 2016, he was also leaning towards uh, decolonization in that presidential plenary. Uh, so, and he, so he never used either of those words, reconciliation or decolonization, but if you have a robust understanding of what those terms mean, you can read them in that speech. So uh, he emphasized that indigenous communities have repeatedly complained that genetic research benefits researchers, but not the indigenous populations being studied. Uh, he discussed in detail the Canadian Institute Institutes for Health Research Guidelines. You can get those online as well, involving Aboriginal people. Those were released in 2010, uh, just months before his presidential plenary. Uh, and there are multiple reconciliation type um, activities within um, those uh, CIHR guidelines, including uh, an emphasis on collaborative research with communities that include signing research contracts, capacity building for communities to participate in research themselves. So not only outsiders coming in doing the research and then drawing the benefits, the training and the capacity building for their non-Indigenous institutions, their non-Indigenous students, but actually figuring out how Indigenous tribal communities can build capacity. And then of course, considering those uh, Indigenous perspectives. So he was beginning to move toward decolonization, and we'll get in two slides to a, a definition of decolonization, but he was moving towards the idea of repatriation of Indigenous life, and we'll come to that in a, in a couple minutes. He was talking about uh, DNA on loan, so Indigenous communities retaining the property rights in DNA, and that just being on loan to researchers. Uh, you must then reconsent. Um, samples for new research projects. So you don't you don't get to just take the DNA and then use it for whatever research you want. Uh, it's sort of implying that the property interest stays with the scientist. Uh, he was talking about indigenous governance of genome science, um, uh, including again, potential intellectual property and commercialization benefits. So let's talk about what decolonization is specifically. I wanna talk about a definition of biocolonialism.
And this definition is something put forward by a um, Indigenous scholars, uh, but even before that, I think in an Indigenous activist group called the Indigenous People's Council on Biocolonialism. And I uh, pulled a definition from a scholar who also writes on biocolonialism from the internet, Laura Lynn White, and you can follow along here. Uh, they note that biocolonialism emerges from the ideological, political, and practical structures of new imperial science that enable the appropriation of Indigenous knowledge and biological resources for the benefit of Western biomedical industries and corporations. You can also include uh, universities. So think back to the 19th century and the 18th century when Indigenous land, natural resources were being appropriated. Uh, for the development of the nation state. Well, similar things have been happening with indigenous biological resources within our bodies. So that the, uh, the extraction of resources, be they biological or natural resources, it's all natural resources, right? The extraction of those resources and the development of them, the development of uh, the value in them for the creation of institutions and economies that belong to the colonial state that are not under the jurisdiction and authority of indigenous people, it's classic colonialism. Uh, so, so it's just applying the bio to that kind of idea. So if you understand that, then you can begin to think about what uh, decolonization in uh, these fields might look like. And so I'm moving from the, the Godry and Lorenz article to another article, and they cite this article. So Eve Tuck and uh, Kay Wayne Yang have been widely cited in Native Studies around the term decolonization. And this is an open source article, so you can just Google and Google it and pick it up. Um, 2012, it was published. So they say, so first let's talk about uh, Godry and Lorenz say, talk about decolonial indigenization. So indigenization is their umbrella, right? This is not the way I use it, but it's the way they use it. And under that umbrella of indigenization, they have inclusion, they have reconciliation, and then they have decolonization. So they say that decolonial indigenization envisions the wholesale overhaul of the academy to fundamentally reorient knowledge production based on balancing power relations between indigenous people and Canadians, transforming the academy into something dynamic and new. That's a great idea to begin with how we get there. That's another question, right? That'll take generations to do that. So that's their definition. Now let's look at Tuck and Yang that are talking about decolonization more broadly, not only within the academy, but they are also centered within the academy, particularly in education programs. And they say that decolonization brings about the repatriation of indigenous land and life. And that's the definition that I really go for. When I'm thinking of using the word decolonize or decolonization, I think what's being repatriated, what's being, um, given back to Indigenous people. Remember when Elizabeth Cook Lynn said, I don't care about reconciliation, I care about restitution of land. She was talking about decolonization, a much more robust term than uh, reconciliation alone, I would say, although reconciliation is part of it. So they say, Tuck and Yang, uh, decolonization is not a metaphor for other things we want to do to improve our societies and schools. Uh, don't too easily adopt decolonizing discourse without actually thinking about what's being restored to Indigenous peoples. So I'll give you an example. Even in our own program, we had, um, you'll see a picture later on, um, there was a a, one of our participants uh, who's a postdoc, and uh, I think he's Métis uh, from up here in Canada, he came in as the postdoc, one of the more senior people in the program, and he had this really cool dress lab coat. I didn't know there was such a thing, but he had a lab coat with some gorgeous Métis beadwork on a medallion, and all the other participants in the summer genome program were su super envious. They, they're like, oh, we want to, you know, beadwork on our, on our lab coats, and so we decided in the next summer program, we're going to actually, because we try to do some kind of craft these community like circle type things for students to decompress after all the lectures and lab work. We try to do some fun creative stuff and a, um, a, a field trip. But uh, so one of the things we decided to do was make lab coats, uh, you know, order in lab coats and then uh, get them to uh, do some bead work or maybe quill work or uh, however they wanted to do that. They, they do something called tufting up here, which I think uses fur and it's colored. It's really beautiful. Um, but some people started call, calling that decolonize your lab coat. And I thought, mm, that's kind of a wishy-washy version of decolonize. Let's not use it that way. What's really being restored to Indigenous people when you're putting beadwork on a lab coat? Think about that. Maybe you will come up with an answer of how that is in part a restoration of Indigenous resources, land or life. 
but I can't, I haven't really thought about it. So, so just think about that when you use that word, maybe try to use it in a more rigorous way and thinking about what's being restored materially. We're talking about material restoration, not simply acknowledging your perspectives, you know, letting everybody be heard, not, not this kind of wishy-washy stuff, actual literal material transfer of wealth and resources, because that's what was taken in the colonial project. And that's what's continues to be taken, right? Wealth extracted from indigenous lands and bodies and cultures. Oh, so I'm going to talk a little, just a, for a second before we move on about what land and life looks like. So if you think about land, the restoration of land and life broadly, life has a lot of room for, for thinking. So it can be resources, capacities, political and cultural sovereignty, which also results in uh, material sustenance for indigenous communities. So what was taken? Well, bodies have been taken in the course of anthropological research, which becomes genome research later. You know, graves were robbed, massacre sites were robbed. Uh, when Wounded Knee happened, you had um, grave robbers basically working on contract for scientists at prestigious institutions out east like Harvard and Columbia, where all of this cutting edge anthropological research was going on, pulling bodies off the massacre sites, boiling them down and sending bones back. This is the theft of, of, of our ancestors that are then turned into resources for scientific knowledge production, right? So returning that, that's what NAGPRA was about, right? Returning blood, there's cases of uh, tribes wanting their blood back that were taken under less rigorous ethical protocols in, in, in earlier centuries and decades, uh, wanting actual DNA back and other biological samples. Uh, the restoration of indigenous land and life can be about restoring indigenous governance authorities and regulatory capacity. We talk a lot about that in uh, tribal uh, review of research. Uh, it can be, again, capacity building, student training, postdocs and professor professorships. So there's a lot of ways to think about what the restoration of indigenous life looks at looks like but we must always be thinking about material financial economic and resource restitution okay now we're moving into the case studies i always spend longer in those definitions but i feel like it's a kind of a baseline that people need to understand the depth of where i'm coming from so I'm going to give a quick uh, example before we move more into uh, a quick couple of examples before we move into the summer internship for Indigenous Peoples and Genomics program overview, uh, which I think might be pretty interesting. Um, for the, because this is an ethics uh, community here. So the first one is a, a green building project that it's about 10 years old now, um, but it's such a great example of something that's not genome science. I used to work in environmental sciences uh, in environmental uh, policy as a planner before I became an academic. So I didn't go back for my PhD until I was 32. For about eight years before that, uh, I, since graduating with a, an undergraduate degree in community planning and then a master's degree in environmental planning, I worked as the environmental planner for federal agencies, including EPA, Department of Energy. I worked for tribal governments as a consultant. I also worked for uh, the Council of Energy Resource Tribes, a national tribal organization in Denver. So I was around a lot of, oh, excuse me, I was around a lot of tribal environmental scientists and non-Indigenous environmental scientists. And so this project is really interesting to me. When I was an assistant professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley, my co-parent, my uh, then husband, was uh, the director of planning for the Pinoleville Pomo Nation, which is a small tribe in Mendocino County, California, but not on the ocean Mendocino that you might all know from movies. It's in the valley in the interior, really hot wine country, very, very hot and dry there part of the year. Uh, but there it's I really loved it was in Ukiah, California. I loved it because it was like a native white town, which is what I grew up in in Flanders, South Dakota. So even though Pinoleville Pomo people are quite different than Dakota people, it was really kind of a comfortable place for me. Plus, I really like wine. And it was one of my favorite organic white wines was grown in Ukiah. So anyway, <laughs> but um, so we, my uh, my husband and I arranged this collaborative, or we were part of it. We were, you know, there were many many people involved. We uh, helped broker this research relationship between uh, Berkeley and um, the the Pomo tribe, and so the tribe wanted to build uh, housing, green housing, uh, and so there were some architects and engineers that uh, got involved from Berkeley. And you see the the lead of this uh, project was Professor Alice Agagino, who's a self described feminist engineer, and uh, for some of to some of you that may sound strange feminism is as much about dismantling hierarchies 
as it is about women and uh, you know dismantling gender hierarchies. There's a lot of feminist scholarship that's actually about uh, dismantling all the other, other kinds of hierarchies. And I really came into conversation with feminist scientists and engineers because they had many of the same critiques of the cultural power of uh, masculinist science as I had of science. And it turns out that my critiques of settler science were also critiques of masculinist science. And so I had a lot of common um, conversation with, with feminist uh, critics of science and technology, but particularly those that were invested in changing science and technology fields from within. And Professor Agagino is one of those people. So uh, she brought some students out, undergrads, grad students. You can see a picture of them, very diverse students. This mattered when she brought these, these diverse students out to the reservation to work with um, uh, native people out there who were wanting to combine a contemporary green building with uh, the use of traditional materials that they had used in their traditional houses. And so this, this group of community members, youth, elders, professionals working for the tribe, not only tribal members, and then all the architects and engineers, the experts from Berkeley, they all came together in these kind of co-design uh, meetings and came up finally with a blueprint for uh, a home. But what they discovered in the, in the process was that they didn't only have technical requirements they had to meet for US green building codes, but they had cultural requirements that had to mesh with those technical requirements. And they discovered that the US green building codes were really meant for urban people. They were urban centric, they were kind of middle class. So there were there were there was implicit anti indigeneity in those codes, uh, anti rural life, you know, they had ideas about how big families were the way they should live. And the Pomo people pushed back on that and said, we need a bigger house, we need a house with a bigger gathering area in the center of the house, we need storage for the canoes we're making, and the baskets we're making and for our regalia for dances, we live very differently than what these green building people from San San Francisco think we should live like these are you know Ukiah is only two hours north of San Francisco and Berkeley but it really is a world away so they had to it, the the my point is the techni the technicians the engineers and the architects had as much to learn in this process as indigenous people had to learn and both of their forms of knowledge were incredibly valuable in eventually writing tribal green building codes that were not only environmentally sustainable but culturally sustainable and so when you had to tweak some of the designs in the house to accommodate cultural criteria, you would you would uh, sort of eat into the efficiency of the house and you'd have to figure out, you know, how do you change the slope of the roof? How do you change the corners? How do you change the actual design to remain environmentally efficient, but also to accommodate these cultural requirements? And there were also spiritual requirements in there as well about where you say morning prayers, spirits uh, hide in square corners. There were all kinds of particular criteria that had to be worked out. And it's really an amazing example of this kind of two-way learning and the building of tribal capacity in the in the process of doing this. I'll get over this one much more quickly. This is just an example of indigenous governance, which falls under inclusion, reconciliation, and decolonization. This is another example from California. I was out, out there on and off 10 years, so I, I did a lot of work out there. Um, one of our graduate students at University of California, Berkeley, in our, in our environmental science program is an Ama Mutsen person, um, Chuck Chuck Striplin uh, up in Sonoma County. Uh, Ama Mutsun people are traditional uh, people in Central Coast, California, slightly into the north. They don't have federal recognition, but that in some ways has been valuable because it allows them to work better with the state of California. So you had the Ama Mutsun band, you had local uh, settler landowners, but people who had been there a couple hundred years. Uh, so had local land knowledge. And the California Department of Environmental Quality were figuring out how to combine all of their knowledges, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge, scientific knowledge. And these were not divided discreetly between each of these communities. We had tribal people with both indigenous knowledge and being trained as environmental scientists. So all of these knowledges are kind of overlapping and articulating, and they were figuring out how to restore some of the uh, indigenous fire management techniques to better manage fire. And you know this is necessary in places like Santa Cruz and the Bay Area and Sonoma County after what you saw last fall. I was actually out there, unfortunately, during that time, and I have never seen 
anything like this in the Bay Area. So we really do need uh, these, these long-standing Indigenous ways of doing fire management um, that were suppressed by settler colonialism. So that's just another example of good governance, uh, that a project that involves inclusion of Indigenous people, but in transformative ways in environmental management. It involves reconciliation, right? Le the, the mainstream society learning about Indigenous ways of life, and it involves decolonization, the restoration of Indigenous land and life, including the restoration of governance authority uh, as scientific authority. So great case study for thinking about those things. But let's move on. This first uh, slide from this program is just a couple of pictures from our uh, Sing Canada program. And again, the Sing US program was started in 2011 uh, at the University of Illinois Institute of Genomic Biology. And my colleague Ripon Molly, who's non-Indigenous, uh, was the PI who I think originally we were funded by the National Science Foundation. I think most of our funding now in Sing US comes from the National Institutes of Health. But he was, uh, so basically when it was founded in 2011, it was a non-Indigenous scientist faculty and Indigenous ethics faculty. This is a kind of a common split. <laughs> what we have seen from 2011 to now 2021 is we have Indigenous participants who were PhD students at, at the beginning of Sing, who came into the Sing program, are now PIs. They are now the leadership, the scientific leadership in Sing US. The non-Indigenous uh, scientific leadership is kind of are you know they're they're full professors. They've kind of stepped back. The Indigenous leadership are in the assistant, maybe going for associate professor level right now. Uh, really have started their own labs, are publishing a lot on Indigenous ethics. So we've seen this happen in, in uh, nine or 10 years. So this is really interesting. Uh, in Sing Canada right now, we are at the stage where Sing US was in 2011. It's people like me who do uh, the more bioethics side of things uh, or the decolonial kind of um, science thinking side of things who are at the leadership of Sing Canada, working with non-Indigenous scientists. But I'm hoping in 10 years, we will see Indigenous scientists from Canada Canada moving into leadership and, and people like myself, of course, will, will be stepping uh, back because I think this should be led by Indigenous scientists, um, but who are trained in decolonial scientific thinking. And this is why we get uh, people who already have their PhDs coming in to sing. We get undergrads who come in uh, who are trying to figure out if they want to stay in STEM fields. We get community people. So we'll get some elders. You see somebody in that right-hand picture, a community member from one of the Indigenous communities up here. They come in because they might be cultural leaders or uh, government leaders in their tribes or their, their First Nations or their bands, and they have to broker research uh, relationships between universities and the Indigenous community. So they come in to sing to get a sense of what does a research culture look like? What does a lab culture look like? What am I really dealing with? It helps them figure out how to work better with scientific researchers. Uh, so we have people of all ages in the SING program. Um, and it is these uh, young PhDs who, who we hope will be taking over SING Canada. Uh, in addition to wet lab activities, we also have bioinformatics sessions. I can't say much about that because I don't go to those. <laughs> Um, I'm super intimidated by statistics and things like that. Um, anyway, but our stu our participants are all required. Uh, and again, these are really basic, right? This is a seven day course in the summertime. What are you going to do in terms of real science in seven days? But you're, you're getting the younger people oriented to this kind of culture. They're making contacts with established scientists uh, in their fields. They may be finding people they can apply to do graduate work with. And the indigenous people that have already come through their PhDs that are say postdocs or advanced graduate students or even assistant professors are getting a community of professionals that they can network with other indigenous people who have come through STEM fields and what they say, the people that already have their PhDs, I was always the only person in my lab. I was one of the only indigenous person in my big 200 uh, person biology class. They get a community here and they get uh, to a sort of umbrella of decolonial thinking to think through their science within. And that's what they don't get in a mainstream genome science training training program. So whatever level Indigenous scientists or, or aspiring scientists are at in their thinking and their development in their field, they're getting something out of the Singh program. These are just a couple of pictures of indigenizing and decolonizing genomics lectures. So we have both classroom lectures. That's Katrina Claw on the right. Katrina uh, got her PhD um, working on pharmacogenomics topics at the University of Washington, Seattle. Uh, 
I don't know how many years ago now, because she had a really long postdoc. And then she just uh, started her lab, I think last year, the year before at the University of Colorado, Denver, she's Dene or Navajo. Disproportionate number of indigenous genome scientists are Navajo. That's really interesting. Um, they emphasize STEM education in Navajo Nation and have for a while. I think that's probably why. Uh, but I have some other theories about why that might be. I've interviewed a lot of Navajo scientists for my own social science research. I should reiterate, if you don't know, I'm basically an anthropologist of science. I started out studying non-Indigenous scientists and then began interviewing Indigenous scientists because I was really interested in why they went into these fields. So I, I probably interviewed Katrina many years ago. Now I, we're colleagues. You know, we learn very much. I learned a lot from her. I don't know what she learned from me. But um, here she is, though, talking about uh, what indigenous genomics looks like. And I think there was a news article on her last year about um, she's worked with um, medicine people at home to figure out how to do her science in a good way. So that's really interesting. And then the, just the picture on the left is uh, me as the lone social scientist sitting with Katrina Claw, uh, with Francine Gachupin, who is uh, Jemez Pueblo and does cancer uh, research, genetics research at University of Arizona. She uh, was one of the leads of our SING program when we were at Arizona a few years ago. And then on the other side of me is Nani Bog Garrison, who's also a Navajo geneticist who retrained in bioethics under Mildred Cho at Stanford. And Nani Ba is now at the Center for Society and Genomics at UCLA, a leading indigenous bioethics thinker. She was one of the original participants as well. So I just cannot tell you how it's so amazing to me to see uh, and it, all of these indigenous people, it looks like it's a lot of women and it is really kind of coming to the fore in, in doing this work. So that's just the, the LC is the US federal term, ethical, legal, social implications of genome research. I think 3% of the budget on dedicated to genome research from the feds in the US is dedicated to these ethics uh, conversations. We do those LC conversations within SING. So students will learn about what federal regulations are around bioethics. They'll learn about the history of how those came into being the Belmont report, the Nuremberg trials, that kind of thing. And then they'll get more recent cases around violations of indigenous rights in genome research. So they learn, they, we have a lawyer, a bioethicist come in, um, Pilar Osario from the University of Wisconsin, who's been really integral to our program since the beginning. And then in Canada, LC is called GELS. I can't remember what it's called, but that's the Genome Canada term. So we uh, do those discussions up here as well. And this is a view of our looks like I have about seven minutes here, uh, a view of our uh, global SING program now. So SING US was first in 2011. Uh, SING Aotearoa New Zealand was in 2016. They were founded, uh, then SING Canada in 2018. SING Australia came online in 2019. We're in conversations with uh, scientists for a SING Mexico. We've also had meetings with people in Chile. We've had interest from people in South Africa. So SING is probably going to keep adding countries. We're going slowly because indigeneity as a concept and a definition does not work the same all over the world. And I think it it's good for us to go slow and be careful and make sure that we have good contacts on the ground, that we know we're working with scientists who have good relations with indigenous communities in the countries that, that Singh might want to expand to. So there's a lot of interest in our program, but there's also a delicate politics, I think, that has to be paid attention to since, you know, working in in New Zealand, Australia, Canada, and the US can be somewhat similar in terms of indigenous politics because they're all settler colonial countries. When you begin to move into other parts of the world where it wasn't settler colonialism, but other forms of colonialism, you have to be a little bit careful about how you work, just not to be especially North America centric, but it's very exciting. These are just a couple of pictures of the SING Canada program. On the left is the first year when we were at Simon Fraser University that was focused on clam and conservation genomics. So that's another thing to know. Each SING program in any country has a different theme every year. And we tend to after the first few years of being at one institution, we then tend to move around and let other let host in institutions take the lead in organizing what is a very complicated, time-consuming meeting to organize. So in the US, we've been at University of Texas, uh, Illinois, University of Washington, Arizona, University of Wisconsin. In uh, Canada, we've been at Simon Fraser and University of Alberta so far. Of course, COVID canceled all of our 2020 SING summer programs, and we're going online for 2020. 21. Some people in Australia, well, even in Australia, they were online. I just spoke for them, even though COVID, they're living a most more normal life in Australia than in many parts of the world. Um, 
but uh, Sync Canada 2018 was clam and conservation genomics. Uh, we had uh, scientists at Simon Fraser who have really good relations with Indigenous communities on the coast, and we did a week there. Uh, on the right is Sync Canada 2019. We were back at the University of Alberta working on chronic wasting disease, the genomic aspects of that, because we've got a prion research institute here, a lot of uh, chronic wasting disease research in Alberta, because we've got... Uh, we, you know, it's moved in actually from, I think the Dakotas from some of those farmed hunting places or, um, uh, so now we've got uh, chronic wasting disease in elk up here, deer and elk. They're worried about it moving into caribou, which is a traditional food source, but also elk are hunted by indigenous people as well. So uh, we're really, we're interested in the conversations between prion research and uh, indigenous hunters knowledge and other hunters too. So we're really interested and again, like that California project, local knowledge, whether it's indigenous knowledge or non-indigenous people's local knowledge. And uh, so this kind of also segues into what we're going to do this summer, which is going to be a virtual SING program. We're really interested in portable genomic technologies and um, for a variety of kinds of research projects, it would really help hunters out if they could have some sort of portable technology to diagnose chronic wasting disease in, a, in, a, in an animal without having to sever the head and send it back to the lab, right? If they could actually do that in the field. So we're currently working to try to get some of these very expensive portable um, genome uh, analysis technologies for, for various SING programs. Uh, and it, it'll work great too during, during COVID time. So that's what was happening in Canada. So we take a cohort of usually 14 to 22 students or participants. And again, undergrads, grad students, postdocs, assistant professors, some community uh, regulators, cultural leaders, et cetera. Uh, and by the way, the younger students really like having elders there. I wasn't sure. They love it. They love, it's just, it's so, and we also have people sometimes bring their children in, although we do, we're trying to figure out childcare and things like that. We do have a disproportionate number of women. And I think that's due to gendered patterns of colonization. I think across higher ed, and you may notice this at S NDSU, I'd be interested to know, are the majority of your indigenous students women? It's interesting, right? And so um, even though the STEM fields tend to be more uh, male dominated, I do think the biology within that I hear is around 50-50 for, uh, for non-Indigenous people. So some interesting gender dynamics to consider. I don't know that we've really dug into that. I think we might, in, in, we might do that in the future evaluation of the program. Um, the other thing to remember or to know about SING participants is they're actually publishing out of the SING consortium now. So all of these in-country programs are hooked together through SING Consortium, which you can go to singconsortium.org and look at uh, those different programs. So in SING Canada, my goal is to get to every province and territory in the next 10 years. We've been in um, uh, British Columbia and Alberta so far. We are in conversation with, um, uh, let's see, Oh yeah, these are just older meetings I'm looking at here. We were going to do uh, H. pylori in the microbiome at University of Alberta last summer. That didn't work out. Uh, we will focus on that in a future year. We have been talking with uh, people at Concordia and McGill universities in Montreal about doing an epigenetics uh, slash intergenerational trauma related uh, SING program. That'll take a lot of care, cultural care, right? And social care of, of our people to do something focused around intergenerational trauma. So we don't shy away from those controversial topics, but we recognize that we're going to need um, uh, a particular kind of expertise there that we haven't normally had to have if we're going to be talking about intergenerational trauma. Uh, we're talking about going back to Simon Fraser and doing something related to salmon genomics as well. Um, I would really like to get into the territories, you know, that are less populated, that don't have urban centers in them. And that's why these portable gen genomic technologies are really interesting. Can we go up into a, one of the um, smaller towns or villages in some of the Northern territories and do a, a summer program without all of the big fancy kind of lab facilities that we would have at, say, the universities in the southern cities in Canada. Sing USA workshop themes. Um, they did cancer genomics at Arizona. They did a lot of population genetics the first four years because that was the area of expertise that the original scientists uh, had that founded Sing. But then we started diversifying our themes, cancer genomics, pharmacogenomics, uh, epigenetics, uh, transcriptomics, and historical trauma. Again, having to be very careful about that theme. 
uh, that was Sing USA. We really focus on getting junior people in Sing published. So there's there's extended mentoring that goes on, particularly for new professors or graduate students. We're strategic about who gets first author, you know, what the author order is, setting up publications and mentoring younger academics to do the work that they need to do to get their publications in order. There's mentoring among some of the scientists around grant getting. Uh, so, so the Sing Consortium stays with participants as as they're rising through their education and careers. Um, and again, it's very focused on their, their, the scientific work, but we also have people within Singh who are doing the ethics side of things, who are doing the community regulatory side of things. So it really is kind of this broad multidisciplinary approach that's attempting to break down these barriers between the academy and the community, uh, Indigenous-led, but within non-Indigenous allies uh, who know how to work collaboratively with Indigenous communities, who have a lot of experience doing that, really also uh, at the center of, of leadership, although they, they are beginning to take a back seat, as I think good allies should after you've built capacity within communities to do this work. So I will stop there. So we have our first question, and it was asked um, by Dennis earlier, a little bit earlier, and it's, it's, you know, decolonization, as you pointed out, takes a great deal of power to make significant changes, right? Um, so what do you suggest that staff, students, and faculty can do within the NDSU system as well as other institutions? I think the first thing is to make sure you're using that, that term correctly, right? And to remind people, this is about the restitution of, of, of wealth. It really is. It's about the restitution of material resources. And if you're always keeping that in mind, how is that guiding your program development, right? You know, we'd be thinking about opportunities. So for example, this is where, you know, the collaborative research stuff is hard and you may, uh, you may have a really good cohort of community-based researchers there. I know in health fields, they're farther along than some other fields. Um, but as one is setting up a collaborative research arrangement, um, I don't know I'm trying to, because I haven't been working in the US in five and a half years, but I know that the Canadian Institutes for Health Research guidelines have been taken up uh, south of the border as well uh, in, in other forms. Um, I really think paying attention to that and what is involved, they give step-by-step uh, -step guidance on how to set up a good collaborative research contract, uh, how you are actually going to do capacity building, you know, those kinds of tangible things. I mean, I think moving towards research arrangements like that could be a good thing for people to do. And that's very difficult. I, anybody who's tried community-based research knows that this is not easy. We don't, not everybody does it well. Uh, if you, and I, I'm kind of of the mind, if you don't want to work in a sustained long-term way with the community, uh, especially if it's an indigenous community, best not to work with them at all. Uh, because it's going to take a lot of time. You're going to get your your area of expertise is going to get diverted or expanded to include collaborative methodologies. And if you are not willing to have your career and your research agenda and yourself changed in that collaboration, better not to do it. This isn't just a two or three year project that you're doing within you know, an NIH grant funding cycle. This is a way of life. It's a major change in your career trajectory. So I think those people that are willing to take that on then begin to dig into what those research arrangements look like. And there are guidelines to do that that do focus on capacity building. Um, uh, sharing of uh, funding. And I know this is difficult, even at University of Alberta, you know, I ended up giving back a $500,000 energy uh, energy uh, kind of resources grant because the administrative system would not allow me to give uh, laptops and money to fund it to uh, research assistants in the the First Nation community I wanted to work with. And I'm like, well, if I can only spend money on grad students that are already at U of A, and there's no indigenous grad students here working in energy, and I can't buy any materials for the community, there's no point. You know, I did this, this collaborative research arrangement so I could truly work collaboratively with this First Nation and the literal national, the national science and engineering uh, uh, funding system here in Canada would not allow me to give resources to the community. So, so then what do you do in that instance? Well, if you're somebody who is on um, these national scientific funding agency advisory boards, if you have pull within those agencies, working towards changing those kinds of regulations. And I think at whatever level you're working at and whatever your expertise is, if you're keeping in mind a, a robust definition of decolonization, you can figure out ways over the course of your career to begin transferring resources, right? It's not just, this is not just cultural sensitivity. It's far beyond that. I don't know, does that help? 
Mm -hmm. Okay. But, and I think uh, Dennis and I are, our brains are heading in the same direction because his question was, can you talk more about the collaborative process and how that works so we can understand it? And I was, I was thinking back to your experience over at Berkeley and how you brought three, multiple groups together, right? Mm -hmm. Some groups that may have not talked to each other yeah. in a long time. How did you go about doing that? Well, this is why I stepped back and said, well, I was just around the edges of it. It actually, a lot of it was um, the, you know, it definitely helped to have my co-parent as an environmental director at the tribe because he's got a PhD in geography and he's done collaborative research in the field and forestry all over the world. And so was pretty schooled in community-based research methods. Not all tribes have somebody like that, right? Working at that level. Um, but it also, uh, they, they had a tribal government that was really, interested in um, in working collaboratively with the university. And then you had Alice Agagino at the university who has this co-design process. And if you look her up, she does co-design uh, engineering uh, projects across a range of uh, activities. Yes, she worked on this green building project, but she also has students because it's Berkeley, right? She has students that are surfers and they did like a surfing co-design. They made a sustainable surfboard and then started a company. I don't know anything about surfboards, but apparently it's really environmentally gross the normal way that they do it. And so they had these surfing engineering students trying to figure out and they were actually working with surfers. That was the community they were working with. And it's her co-design process that she's really focused on across a range of topics. So, so um, how did I get onto that? So it was, I think it was a partly about having the right people that were invested for a, a variety of different reasons and in a variety of disciplines in working collaboratively and who really had this value, even though she hadn't worked with indigenous communities before, she's a feminist researcher who had this value that the end user in their language, I would say the community, had really valuable, important knowledge to contribute to this, this co-design process. Uh, and and so it, it really was about having researchers who are fundamentally against hierarchy and research, who are getting away from, from those ways of thinking about whose knowledge counts, right? Um, it's not that the university knowledge and expertise and STEM knowledge doesn't count. Of course, it's quite valuable. But if you learn to listen to communities, they have really valuable knowledge as well to contribute to these, to these processes. But I think I forgot your initial question. <laughs> oh, no, actually, you didn't, because what I heard you talk about was um, collaboration, co these collaborative arrangements require people with expertise and probably commitment to listening to each other. Yeah, um, and, and, right. And Professor Ag Agagino, this is central to all of her work, right? She is a co-design person. Yeah, this is not just a one grant cycle, let's go get the Indians involved. You know, I get called all the time by scientists who've never worked with Indigenous people. Uh, we need to get Indigenous, because Canada now, especially since reconciliation, they want Indigenous collaboration on every single grant. Oh my God, I get like a request today to sit on somebody's grant. I don't, I don't have time to do that, right? But suddenly all these people who've never worked with Indigenous communities, you know, they want to check that box, right? It's That's not the way to go about it. It's... Mm -hmm you're not going to get anything done. You're going to walk into that community and get hammered, right? Like anybody in, in this audience who's worked with Indigenous communities knows, this is a long process of building trust, learning how to speak each other's languages, right? Learning how to conduct yourself appropriately. These are really different cultures, like different disciplinary cultures are really different. So is obviously the any community and, and the academy. Yeah. So we have a somewhat personal question, I think. Um, the question is about uh, tribal affiliation in some cases was based on family history. That is, how many people in your family history were members of the tribe? Is this still the case? And if so, how will genetics and genomics change that? So I assume this is a non-native person asking this question. So it's uh, because in, in Indian country, we even like, you know, regular people know all these convoluted rules we have. It's different from tribe to tribe. So, and then it's different again up in Canada. Um, most tribe, every tribe in the US that I know of, uh, you have to trace to the base roles, right? And the base roles are constructed around allotment period, late 19th century, because the, the colonizer needed a way to manage the Indians. So they needed a list of Indians so they could give them land and then well, what, whatever's left over give to settlers, right? This is kind of, it goes back to land transfer, beginning to develop registers of native people. Tribes take over uh, in the mid 20th century tribes begin to take over their own enrollment criteria. So it really depends on the tribe, but they all require biological descent from a base role. 
pre-World War II, that was not the case. Actually, everybody on the reservation, because 90% of Indians, I'm using the terminology of the day, were on the reservation. This is the reservation era. World War II, urbanization happens in the 1940s and 50s, massive migration off reservation. That's when they start using the base roles and requiring biological descent. Before that time, everybody on the res gets enrolled, including non-native spouses, including uh, adopted children. It's no longer the case. There has to be biological descent. Now, then it gets even more complicated. Is it biological descent to the base role only, like Cherokee Nation does, or is it like my tribe does, Siston Wapton? descent to the base role plus a quarter Indi Indian blood. I always use scare quotes around that. Do you have enough ancestors? I guess that's kind of getting at this, this issue as well. Um, you need more ancestors to have that symbolic quarter blood than if you just, anyway, it's very complicated. And, and it, different tribes have different ordinances. You can probably find their enrollment ordinances on their websites. So you can figure that out. Now that's the official way to be a citizen of a tribe. There's also our informal criteria of belonging, right? You know, who's your family? Who's your mom? Who's your auntie? Who's your cousin? Uh, not all of those people might be enrolled, but we'll ask who's your family in order to gauge who's, who's affiliated. So you have to think in terms of tribal citizenship on one hand, and then family, and then cultural affiliation. And those things are overlapping sometimes, but they're not synonymous. And we understand that well within tribal communities, and I'm sure it's totally confusing to everybody else. <laughs> So, thank you. Yeah. Um, what um, I'm sorry, I, I asked I asked that question, okay. <laughs> but I was more interested in the latter part of the question. That is, if, if this if that's true in some cases, then how will genetics and genomics change oh, that? Genomics. Uh, so. Genetic ancestry testing is completely useless. Um, and I get into this in my book. So I don't know if you've read it. So uh, I talk about that in my book and some other articles. Genetic ancestry testing, like you buy from ancestry.com or 23andMe, gives you that percentage of ethnic ancestry. That's going back to founding populations on a continent, right? That's not affiliating you with any people. There's no named ancestor. And in contemporary tribal affiliation, be it citizenship or just cultural informal affiliation, we really care about who are you related to. Who are your grandparents? Who are your ancestors, right? Those percentage tests don't tell you anything like that. Those really appeal to people who have no lived experience in indigenous community, who are really thinking more along racial or ethnic terms. Oh, I got that 26% Native American. That doesn't mean anything to us if you can't affiliate with a particular people, capital P. Um, within tribes and First Nations in Canada, they do use parentage tests, the DNA profile or the parentage test, but that is to uh, link an eligible uh, an eligible person for enrollment to a, an ancestor within the tribe or to a relative. That that percentage test won't do that. The parentage test, sibling test will. So um, one of the things that I, I've heard you talk multiple times about collaborative, and you also talked about um, uh, the co-design and how that works in listening and women in science, as well as why the Navajo people tend, tend to be more, scientists tend to be more women. Would you say a little bit more about why you think that is? Because you intrigued me when you said, I have a theory. Oh, yeah. So well, what is your theory, ma'am? Yeah, there's two things actually I was talking about. So uh, in relationship to Navajo Nation, and I, if I were to have continued my ethnographic study of Navajo scientists, I would have dug into this, but I stopped and moved on to kind of in helping administer Singh instead of doing the anthropological work. Peter McDonald, who was their president in the 1980s, had an engineering degree. And Peter McDonald really did, they began to emphasize, I think, STEM education within Navajo Nation. If there's any Navajos on here, they might, you know, have more background on this. This is just my informal conversation with Navajo scientists. But they really did emphasize STEM education, I think, in their K through 12 education and also in Navajo Nation uh, College. Um, and I think it goes back to President McDonald. When I, I did my master's at MIT and plan, I was in planning. Uh, there were two plant native planners at MIT and everybody else was in STEM fields and they were all Navajo. It was like Alaska native me and 11 Navajos at MIT in the 1990s. So it's really interesting. They really do focus on STEM stuff. And so it's not surprising to me after having seen that in the 90s that all the two thirds of the geneticists I meet are Navajo. They're also the I, second largest tribe in the country, Cherokee Nation first and then Navajo Nation. Um, and then in terms of women, um, and there may be other people in the audience who study this more too, just the gendered patterns of colonization. And it's not only native people who notice this, but I think black people notice this as well, that there do tend, women have tended to access higher education. Um, there, you know, think about the, the gendered patterns of discrimination against native men and black men, who's disproportionately incarcerated, 
right? You know, who's not getting uh, who's, who's getting discriminated against in ways where they're not getting through K through 12. So I, I know there are people out there who study gender and racism far, far more than I do, but these are common patterns that we see. In, uh, and then we're beginning, we see this in our SING program in SING Canada in 2018, we had one native young man for, who came up from the United States. We do do some international exchange and we had like 12 native women. <laughs> And many of them were older mid-career women. So that was really an interesting year. And he's like the young traditional student. I said, what do you think about being up here in Sing Canada with all these older women? And he said, I love it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, he got, he got good mentoring, I think too. So yeah, it's, uh, anyway, that's, that's my theory. It's not, uh, this is not really what I study, but it's something I notice by practically engaging in these fields. We've got another, um, Another question about affiliation. The affiliation with Native nations strikes me as a strange concept. In some sense, this seems very different from other nations that typically have some path to citizenship for people that immigrate into that nation. I am wondering if you think that this is this exclusivity might be counterproductive. Yes, I'm going to I was sort of hinting to that in an older, uh, in the previous comment I made, I'm going to bring up an article that I want to cite for people. This is the great thing about Zoom, I can just pull up my, my uh, stuff. This, this is not really the fault of tribes. <laughs> so going back to what I was saying about World War II, we did do naturalization before World War II. So when you got all the Indians on the reservation, which, you know, was for colonial purposes, but that's what it was, uh, you enroll everybody. You, everybody knows who's related to everybody. So uh, it, it was actually quite common to enroll spouses who were either members of other tribes or who were non-native. My great-grandmother was Métis from Saskatchewan, enrolled, they came to the U.S., got enrolled at Turtle Mountain Chippewa, married my great-grandfather. She died as the oldest tribal member in Flanders, South Dakota. They enrolled her in 1941 when they still enrolled spouses. Everything changes in World War II when, when you have 75% of people moving off reservation. And then you're like, wait a minute, we can't just enroll all their children and grandchildren anymore. They don't live here. We don't know who they are. This is when blood quantum, I mean, you always have federal blood quantum in terms of the feds managing you, but this is when tribal blood quantum begins to become ascendant. Uh, and then you get pushed back against that. And in the 70s, you get Indian self-determination and you get a lot of, you know, all the social and political movements that were happening in the 70s. Uh, and we have this kind of conversation happening today in tribal communities and in Native studies, where we say we need to take back control over our citizenship. Well, ideally, yes. But when you live in a the most powerful nation state in the world, you know, in terms of its military power and its economic power, although I think that's declining, um, who holds all the political economic power? It's the state. You know, there's only so much maneuvering you can do. And you see this. So I'm going to cite this scholar if you're really interested in this. Kirsty Gover, no relation to Kevin Gover. Kirsty Gover is a New Zealand scholar who, for some reason, came to law school in the US and studies tribal governance. She has an article from 2008 called um, Genealogy is Continuity. Genealogy is Continuity. And she does a survey of 330 tribal constitutions and how enrollment changes over the course of the 20th century. And she shows that it is always a response to the political economy of the powerful US and to shifts in federal policy, which are a response to the political economy. When you live in a colonial soup in a powerful nation state, we maneuver as best we can. But if you don't have cultural and, and economic authority and you say, we're just gonna naturalize everybody, do you have houses for everybody? Do you have jobs for everybody? Do you have resources for everybody? It'll fundamentally change your population. And then you have to start thinking about who controls the government, who controls policy. So yes, ideally we naturalize, um, but, there really is a, a limit to the kind of comfort that people have because of uh, economics, politics, and culture in terms of doing that, really opening up the roles. But it's an ongoing conversation for sure. We have a lot of vigorous debate about this um, within community. How, how do you spell her last name? Gover, G-O-V-E-R, first name Kirsty, K-I-R-S-T-Y. And she's got a book on this as well, but this article was... Um, in uh, American Indian Law Review, volume 33, and it's 2008. Thank you. Yeah, it's really fascinating if you're interested in that. And Marianne, somebody might have already put it up on the, the chat. chat. Oh yeah, yeah thank you. There. Thank you. So one of the other questions that, that I asked you or at the be very beginning before um, anyone joined us 
is what is a question that, that you get often and or like answering? And you talked about <laughs> spirituality versus science and yeah. how that conversation changes as soon as you add the indigenous component to it. Yeah, people often, um, especially scientists will ask this question, right? Um, well, you know, this is an irreconcilable difference. You know, they ha you have spirituality and we have science and these are different worldviews. And are we supposed to curtail our science because you're afraid we're going to disprove your origin stories? <laughs> and um, I wrote an article about this actually um, called Tell Me a Story, Genomics versus Indigenous Origin Narratives. And this was published in 2013 in Gene Watch, which is a great little kind of genetics education, genetics and policy magazine um, from the Center for Society and Genetics out of Berkeley. So it's kind of an advocacy organization that does public, ed public education. And again, 2013, tell me a story. So what I hear often from scientists and, and because they're thinking in terms of, you know, think about the creationist, the Christian creationist pushback to say uh, textbook standards and the teaching of evolution in public schools, right? This was a big topic topic when I was at University of Texas, because apparently a lot of the textbooks are published in Texas, and then they're trying to impose these Texas creationist kind of guidelines across textbooks across the country. And so all of the genome scientists at UT were super like active in this, this kind of conversation. And when I would give talks on this stuff in anthropology, when I was there, they were really worried, you know, well, are indigenous people are just like Christian creationists. I'm like, nah, you don't see indigenous people being against the teaching of evolution in schools. <laughs> this is not what we do. What we're really put, cause we're, we're basically okay with that. Like we have, there are different ways to tell the story of creation or existence. Um, and I, and I, and I tell people, you know, basically indigenous worldviews are not, don't tend to be proselytizing. We have not told people you have to believe the way we believe, right? There, there, there has tended to be an accommodation of multiple worldviews. What there's not an accommodation of is you don't get to steal everything and replace our culture with yours, which is what settler colonialism has attempted to do. Elimination and replacement, one wor universal worldview. And so I often say, you know, when I hear scientists and creationists fighting, these are colonizers on the other side of the fence who have universalist worldviews and they can't tolerate each other's narratives. We're not like that. You got the natives on this side of the fence saying multiple ways of thinking, just don't steal all our stuff and force us to do everything the way you want to do it. And you guys are arguing over there. I know that's a little simplistic, but I try to remind people um, just because I might have the same adversary as you doesn't mean that they are my adversary for the same reason that they're your adversary. So um, anyway, so I think to, to a lot of times indigenous pushback against genome science, particularly the migration science, migration um, population genetics, is about how were our samples taken? Were they taken according to our values? Who's storing them? Who owns them? Are you reconsenting them for that next research project? Or did you take our blood, put it in your deep freeze and assume you can send it off to every other scientist around the world for every other question they want to ask? That's not okay with us. Are you studying our bones that were stolen? If so, we want them back and we want to repatriate. These are critiques of power. These are critiques of cultural uh, power and political power. And I encourage people to remember that. And I know that a lot of indigenous critics will use language like spirituality versus science. But I think one, um, we are also limited by the English language and by these binaries that exist in English, right? You've got science versus the spiritual. That's not our binary, that's settler binaries. You've got savage versus civilized, right? You've got uh, all of these kinds of hierarchies of life that adhere in uh, Eurocentric thought. And we are struggling, I think, having to use English instead of indigenous languages to articulate our critiques in a language that's full of settler binaries that actually don't exist in indigenous languages. So when you push indigenous language speakers to talk about these things in more complex terms, they will often say, yes, it's different when I speak Dakota or I speak Penobscot but I can't actually say that in English very well. So then they resort to this spiritual, right? That's a whole other talk I give too about uh, kind of as critique of spirituality that <laughs> I can't get into. Did, did that answer the question a little bit? Um, it did. And I think, I think that as you were talking, one of the things that came to mind was the store um, Henrietta Lacks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because it feels like, you know, she was, because of her, we learned so much. Yeah. And yet, it was taken without her permission. Her cells were taken without her permission and all of that. And so going back to that and saying, okay, wait a minute, who owns this, right? Really, to whom does it belong? And, and um, so 
Thank you. Another question that just came in is um, they would like you to do a little bit of forecasting. <laughs> I'm not good at that, but okay. uh, do you foresee federal agencies changing and adapting their policies and regulations on how funds can be used to better align with indigenous traditional knowledge and ways of knowing? I have really pulled back from my interactions with the US federal government and because so I can focus on learning about Canada because it is so different. But I will say that Sing US, um, and I'm doing this up here, they are so we've got this data sovereignty network that has also emerged out of Sing, and so that's uh, really got people from all four countries, Canada, US, New Zealand, Australia. Um, so if you look up Indigenous data sovereignty, you'll find all kinds of conferences happening in papers and people on Twitter. Uh, they are really focusing on intervening in um, some of the NIH policy, I know. Uh, and I should have, so Keolu Fox is somebody to look at, K-E-O-L-U. Fox. He's a native Hawaiian genome scientist. I think he's at UC San Diego right now. Um, uh, Maui Hudson, who's at uh, University of Waikato in New Zealand. Uh, Desi Lone Bear Rod Rodriguez. Desi's enrolled at one of the Montana tribes, but she just took a job at UCLA. I think, I can't remember in which department, but she does, um, uh, she's a a demographer and she's working on data sovereignty stuff. So yeah, you've got these young, younger than me, indigenous kind of scientists and policy people who are trying to intervene and that's where to look, I think. Um, I should have come prepared with all these citations actually. Um, yeah, I have them. I can maybe send some. Dennis, could, should I send them to you or? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I've got quite a few on my desk because I'm teaching my Indigenous Techno Science course right now. And then in terms of Canadian policy, uh, we've got a Silent Genomes Project. That's yeah, we've got a lot going on, a lot actually. But it is being led by Indigenous scientists that are moving up through the ranks along with allies who have done long-term collaborative research with Indigenous communities. And yeah, really pushing the feds on these things. So I guess the, prog I mean, the, the progress I've seen since the Human Genome Diversity Project in the early 90s to now I don't like to use the word progress, but whatever I will, it's, it's meaningful, it's noticeable. Yeah, and so hopefully that, that keeps going. So there's movement. Yes, there is, yeah. And it was pretty bad to begin with, so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Every little bit, right? That's yeah, there's movement, uh -huh. um, The um, There's a reference that one of the, the uh, Participants mentioned was Robin Wall Kimmer's book, Braiding, Braiding Sweetgrass. Sweet mm -hmm. So, um, okay. So mm -hmm. Dennis That's would a beautiful like. Beautiful book, yeah. I'm sorry. Dennis would like to hear more about mentoring. Mentoring. Meaning mentoring. Who? 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 who mentoring? Well, uh, well <laughs> you you mentioned how students were mentored. Uh huh. And so, how do you do that? Does because to be honest, as I say, there's a difference between knowing and understanding. Yeah. The best I could do is understand, and I don't think I've got that even. Knowing I'm not going to be able to do. Because, and I think you're absolutely right with how long the collaboration has to be, and that yeah, yeah. the collaboration really has got to be a collaboration on terms that the people collaborating need. Yeah, so so the, the mentoring, I would like to hear more about that if I could, of the students. Like how you would mentor an Indigenous student not being Indigenous yourself? Yes, I do. I get asked questions like this too by non-indigenous, and I'm like, well, you have to talk to other non-indigenous people who <laughs> have done it. One thing I've noticed though is, it's not only like when I interviewed a lot of the um, the the native genome grad students when they were still students, now they're professors or postdocs. They said it doesn't also have to, because there were so few Indigenous people that would be their PIs, right? They said it doesn't have to be an Indigenous person necessarily. Somebody said they had a Nigerian PI, somebody else had a South Asian PI, people who came from cultures where they were not dismissive of, say, community, religious, or spiritual beliefs, and they understood that those also were something that you would hold in the other hand while you're also doing your science. So people who were willing to, like, there was one student who talked about snakes being taboo in their culture and another one, owls taboo. And so having a PI who was mindful about, you know, if you had a snake in the, how do you have a snake in the lab with a lab member who's got a taboo around that? So actually just entertaining it as a legitimate predicament to have to be dealt with versus poo-pooing it as superstition. These are really easy things in some ways, right? Um, so, but then we are at a chicken and egg problem. Diversity 
generates more diversity. And when you don't have any, <laughs> how do you keep those students in STEM? The other thing that we found that really works is if you are a PI who doesn't come from a worldview where you know what you're doing uh, and you're learning and you're learning slowly and probably feel like you're, you know, misstepping sometimes, but you're trying making uh, room and resources for those students to get that kind of mentoring somewhere else. So a lot of uh, the Indigenous scientists I know were working with non-Indigenous PIs, uh, but they would go to SOCNIS, the Society for the Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science, which is not only Native Americans and Chicanos. A lot of Black students go there. Other students, people from underrepresented communities in STEM fields will go to that meeting. There's a lot of presentation of scientific research at that annual meeting, but there's also a lot of mentoring sessions, you know, and a lot of conversations about how do I stay in science? I'm first generation in the university. My parents don't get research. Everybody thinks because I'm going to do a PhD, I'm going to be a doctor. You know, this will resonate with a lot of people who come from first generation university families. Um, that really helps going to things like ACES or SING. So trying to find resources to get them that, that mentoring they need in other places. Um, I know that's probably not an answer you couldn't have figured out on your own, but I would also talk to people who have had long-term collaborative relationships with Indigenous communities and learn from their lessons as well. SING Australia is the only SING program that also invites non-Indigenous scientists. We're only Indigenous participants in our other countries right now, but I have had non-Indigenous scientists say, I'd like to go to a SING program and learn how to do, to do this work better. So that's a need we've recognized. And as we have the time and capacity, we'll probably apply apply for funding to grow SING, to have maybe a separate uh, session for non-Indigenous people to learn how to, to have, take part in these conversations too. And that would, could help them with their mentoring, I would say. And their additional resources have just been posted in the chat forum. So awesome. thank you to Robert and to Danny for doing that. Thank you. Um, as you were talking, one of the things that struck me was um, uh, Again, going back to the collaborative relationship um, and the feminist engineer and those kind of pieces. Um, what I've learned from some of my Native friends is the, um, and I'm wondering if you think it has an influence, is related to the matriarchy of Native peoples and if that has an influence, do you think? In but, representation well, of women in science right I'm, I'm just wondering if it has an influence because i i don't know how many folks realize um that many native peoples were matriarchies that's a good question i mean that would have been a good question for me to pursue when i was doing anthropology on native scientists it's a really good question <laughs> one of the things i was going to say is i this is the other part of my theory um what one thing I noticed in interviewing Native scientists is they were disproportionately from land-based communities versus in Native studies or in other humanities and social science fields. I have found that a lot of Native people in the humanities and social sciences are they're disproportionately from urban communities, not from the reservation, not from rural communities. And now we are tracked away from STEM fields, all of us, whether we're urban or res. So that there's that factor. But why was I seeing 90% of indigenous scientists coming from rural areas. I wonder if it's because they hunted, they fished, they raised animals, they got interested in these kind of cellular level things, they got interested in biology. That's my theory. And I would like to have explored that more because really it is about 90% why that, you know, why, why are all the urbane people in social sciences and humanities and the rural people are off doing science? I think that's fascinating. Not totally, but a lot. Mm -hmm. It was a noticeable divide. Um, so but yeah, the, 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 the matriarchy stuff, I hadn't really thought about that because I'd already been knowing we have this gendered pattern of colonization anyway. We see this in higher ed. I did a, when I was a planner, I did the, uh, the um, analysis on Siston Wapton's five-year tribal census one year. And I noticed that uh, like the rest of the, pop, uh, rest of the population, native women were, were paid less than men even though we were more highly educated, we made less money. <laughs> Interesting, right? You know all the reasons for that. It's, mm -hmm. it's active discrimination and it's what fields women are tracked into and that kind of thing. So, yeah. So um, Tyler would like to know, how can we best promote cultural appreciation and promote inclusion in STEM? You know, what are, what are the primary barriers in the way that indigenous people um, 
in the way for Indigenous people to work within these fields. I mean, I've mentioned some, what some of the cultural challenges are, and these are just examples, right, and, and how to deal with that. I think one of the main challenges, though, it's not even for the university unless they're going to extend their reach. We at the University of Alberta, this is how it is, I'd assume it's the same down there. Um, we have a minimum uh, grade point to declare a biology major. We have a minimum grade point to declare a native studies major and, and required classes. A lot of times, na even native students who, and, and other rural students who come from uh, school systems where they didn't have adequate math and science, they, they just don't even have enough math to get into a biology major. Uh, it wasn't offered or, you know, they were tracked away from it or, or whatever. Uh, so we need to have some way to have students have access to the kind of transition year training that they need to get into these kinds of majors. This is really important. Uh, and so what does the university do? You know, you may want to recruit students into these majors. But if, if they're coming out of a school system in which they're not adequately prepared, this is why the university doesn't only get to think about their own inclu inclusion processes. They've got some makeup work to do with students coming out of communities without adequate preparation as well. I think that one's key. And so often, you know, I wonder, I, I do this university program, but I do work with a lot. There's a lot of summer science and STEM programs up here in uh, in Alberta that are focused on K through 12. I think that uh, that's, all, that's also really key, and especially as we see the defunding of our public school systems, right? I mean, these are things, you know, so more than culture, I actually do think its resources often. Um, there are those cultural problems, right? You know, students will get in and say, I'm the only one in the lab. I'm the only one in the biology class. So I go home and people say, why are you doing this? They've stolen our blood. That I think those kinds of things we can, we can overcome within programs like ours. And we see a, a burgeoning of indigenous STEM programs. I've worked with Natural Resources Canada on one related to forestry, that's going really well. But um, getting people to even get into the classes they need in the university to begin encountering the cultural challenges they have. It's, it's the lack of resources that come first and then the cultural challenges, I think often come second, but. It's interesting, you framed it in a, in a way that Minnesota has the, um, they talk about the achievement gap and there's some work to reframe it to from the achievement gap to um, to another word other than achievement because it, that puts it on the burden on that. I think it actually comes down to a resource gap. Yeah, to, yeah. To your point. So we are coming to the end of our time. I have a question, but my last question for you is if people remember nothing else from your conversation today, what are two things you'd like them to remember? Well, they might not remember this because I don't know that I touched on it, but it should be implied. Indigenous knowledge is not science, but it's not not science. Indigenous knowledge is any knowledge that Indigenous people do in the service of Indigenous sovereignty, self-determination, and, and thriving, political, cultural, and economic thriving. We deploy all kinds of knowledges, as long as it's in the interest of that, right? In the thriving of our peoples, and the thriving of our lands and our communities and our economies, I say it's indigenous knowledge. So I try to get away from that binary between science and tradition, right? Scientists have traditional forms of knowledge. I mean, there are accounts of scientists having dreams and intuitions and then making a quote unquote discovery, right? But that's written out of the scientific record. There are many different forms of, of knowledge that I think are legitimate, uh, that are instructive, but we that's going back to one of those binaries I think we have in Eurocentric culture. There's science versus spirituality right? There's science versus folk knowledge. I want us to um, think in a more complicated ways and try to get away from these binaries when we can and think about there. I think there are, I said it a better a couple of weeks ago in another talk. I think um, science implies a particular method. And I think all peoples can take advantage of that method. And then, and then, so think about it like that, right? And then I also make a distinction between little s science, which is the method, and big s science, which is the corporate, militaristic, institution, you know, capitalist institution, that's big S science, all of that, 23andMe, the University of Alberta hospital system, right? But then there's little S science with which many different people can do. And that's really about a, you know, evaluating a particular method that yields knowledge about the world, about the natural world, right? Those are the kinds of things I want people to think about. And I like that. As a Thank farm you. kid, I like it. Yeah, yeah, right. Thanks. You were doing science on the farm probably, right? Exactly, exactly. Totally. Thank you, Dr. Talbert. We so appreciate you being with us today. Thank Dennis, you. It was really good you. to be here. Well, I want to thank Professor Talbert as well for an, for an excellent presentation. 
Uh, it sets the bar high for all uh, of our presenters. I also want to thank uh, Leanne Wolf for doing a wonderful job with moderation. I have to do my uh, required thank yous as well for the folks who are sponsors of these events, including the NDSU Office of the President, the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, the YWCA Cass Clay, Humanities North Dakota, and the Department of Anthropology and Sociology. I'd also like to invite people to the Wednesday, March 24th talk. Um, we It's going to be Dr. Uh, Ju Oak Kim, her presentation is going to be attending to racial violence and anti-racism. There are more details available on our website, the NPEI's website and Facebook page. And of course, we will be doing more publicity. But once again, Professor Talbert, this was a great talk. So thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.